I'm here to start the discussion uh, on Obamacare. And really what we're talking about is what effect do our panelists and the audience believe it will have on health care in the United States, uh, on the industry, and on the ability to innovate, because that's where the future of health care lies. And we all know that because of our backgrounds. And, and uh, so first, a word about what's been happening. We've gone through a um, cataclysmic event last week where the, uh, the uh, government was shut down for a couple of weeks, actually, on the basis of, of uh, a faction of uh, people in Washington believed that Obamacare was not popular and had to be taken down. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, as we approach the precipice uh, of defaulting, the nation defaulting, they backed off and, and, and Obamacare continues. Uh, people are trying to sign on to get their plans and they're having difficulty. That will be solved for sure. Uh, it may take longer than people hoped, but it's going to happen. Uh, but what, what is it that we want as a nation? What should we want? We should want that all the people, all Americans, uh, should have some form of health care and some kind of insurance that they can afford. Uh, we should want that, that health improves and that, that the industry is supported to the degree that they can innovate and bring about those changes in health care that are the dreams that we all have. Uh, we've seen a dramatic improvement in, in uh, lifespans, in, in quality of life, We've seen conquering of some diseases to some degree, at least control. Where, you know, since 1981, we've seen the impact on HIV infections. Where would that be without research, without the industry? We've, we've heard this morning about the reduction in deaths from cardiovascular diseases, uh, heart attacks and strokes, uh, dramatic uh, improvements in these parameters. Uh, we've also heard about some of the beginnings of real changes in, in cancer and others. So what, where, where are we with Obamacare? First of all, we need to have everybody covered. We need to have a control of costs at some point. We need to have a choice. And, and all of these are made available in, in the program. Uh, what wasn't discussed enough was the fact that we had Romney Care. It started in 2006 and, and required people and businesses to have, to have health care insurance. It, it subsidized uh, the poor so that they would have their insurance. It had penalties for not being insured. I mean, all of this was in place, and people in Massachusetts, where it started in 2006, are happy with the results. I think there, there may be a few disgruntled, but there are few, and most people are satisfied with what's happening in Massachusetts. And therefore, why can't it happen in the United States? And so that's what it's about. And, and uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time because we have, uh, I would say, world experts on this panel. Uh, we're able to, we're able to, to convince uh, three, so three industry leaders, really, uh, to join us today, and I'm, I'm really uh, delighted that they're here. Uh, first, uh, on my left is Ken Frazier, uh, who is uh, uh, he's, uh, a lawyer. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> he, start, he, he, started, he started his career started his career at Penn State, went to Harvard Law School, uh, uh, joined uh, uh, Merck in 1992 and became general counsel in 2006. He, he led the strategy for, for defense of the company against liability from Viox, and that was really critical for the company. Between 2007 and 2010, executive VP and president for uh, Merck Human Health, and then in 2010 he became Merck's president, and 2011 became 
uh, he added the title of CEO and chairman. And so, uh, uh, welcome, uh, Ken. Next to him is uh, Alex, Alex Gorski. Uh, not a lawyer, he's a soldier. Uh, Alex began his career uh, at the U.S. Military Academy. I don't know that I've known anybody else with that kind of background. And, and uh, he was at West Point. Uh, he was six years in the U.S. Army and, and rising to captain. Uh, and then he took an, an, a, an MBA at Wharton in 1996. He started his career in the pharmaceutical industry at Janssen in 19, eight, 1988 and, and uh, was there for a number of years, uh, rising all the time, and then and moved to Novartis in 2004 as chief operating officer and head of the general medicines uh, division, and then came back to J&J &J 2008 as, uh, where he uh, quickly rose to chairman and CEO which he is since 2012. So welcome, Alex. Uh, and then uh, last, on the far left, is John Lechleiter, uh, bachelor's in chemistry. So we have a lawyer, a, a soldier, and now we have a scientist. <laughs> uh, uh, a bachelor's in, in chemistry, Xavier University, PhD in chemistry at Harvard in, in 1980. Uh, he, uh, Joined, he joined the industry, he joined Lilly in 1979 as a process chemist. And, and those of you <clears throat> who understand the, the uh, nuances in the industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, if you are a process chemist, you are a real chemist, <laughs> as, a, as opposed to a medicinal chemist who diddles around the edges. <laughs> and, and then, and then he, he rose, he rose in the industry, he came up the research line, and, and did every, every possible job and, and, and became executive vice president for the pharmaceutical operations in 2004. In 2005, became president and chief operating officer and director of Lilly. In 2008, became uh, CEO and chairman. So we have, we have three people who know everything about the industry because they've been uh, a major part of their careers in the industry. Uh, we have deep knowledge, uh, and we're going to ask them lots of questions. And, and so uh, I, I will just start by saying that, that uh, the Affordable uh, Care Act is law. Uh, Obama had it passed in 2010. He was reelected as, as that as his major accomplishment. Uh, it was... Uh, said to be, found to be constitutional by the Supreme Court. So it is, it's, it's happening, and there's no way around it. Therefore, what we want to examine uh, are various things. Uh, we're going to have the 30 million people hopefully covered at some point, and, and uh, we've got to see what this can lead to. So I'm going to ask a, a few questions, and I'll start with you, Ken. Uh, how will the implementation of Affordable Care, uh, uh, care Act affect the healthcare industry? And what does the approach suggest for industry and for, and for consumers going forward? Ken, you want to give us your ideas? Thank you, Roy. Let me start with a clarification. Uh, I am a lawyer, uh, but my wife always says when you're introduced, you should say I'm a lawyer, but not in the pejorative sense of the term. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here this, uh, this afternoon. I was here for the morning presentations, and I have to say they were not only stimulating, but they were actually very inspirational. So thank you for allowing me to be in such a, an august uh, uh, assemblage of, of incredible scientific uh, talent and leadership. So let's take a step back and talk about the Affordable Care Act. In some ways, I think it's misnamed. I think it would more appropriately be called the Affordable Insurance Coverage Act because I think its main objective is to ensure that we have this insurance coverage, adequate insurance coverage for these 30 million Americans and also for other Americans who frankly feel that they can't afford what's available today or whose uh, employers might not want to continue to provide privately uh, paid for health care. So I think its main focus 
has always been on affordable insurance coverage. And that's not to criticize it, it's just to clarify uh, that it's really not aimed at changing the care paradigm, the delivery of care paradigm. Uh, the act was designed to improve competition in consumer access in the individual and small group insurance markets. That's what it was there for. And it appears that now in this first uh, enrollment year, the premise that the market can be organized to facilitate that kind of price competition seems to be correct. We recently saw in an October 11th um, article written in Bloomberg that premium prices for insurance at every one of the four levels at the state exchanges is about one-third lower than previous markets. So price and competition seem to be coming through. Focus group testing by the Department of Human, Health and Human Services also highlights that for people signing up, they have two concerns. Number one is they want to make sure that their physician is in the plans network. And number two, they're worried about premium price. Now that's an interesting thing to keep in mind, premium price as well as whether your physician is covered. We also know that the success depends on the ability to enroll young, healthy, lower income people to stabilize the market risk because the other purpose of the act was uh, to prevent insurance companies, as it was said, from competing on the basis of underwriting. So we have to have a bunch of healthy young people in the market for it to work economically. So what's wrong with low premium product products, low premium products? Well. Almost by definition, if you have a low premium, you're going to have high out-of-pocket costs. And that's where the dilemma for innovation comes in. There's a growing body of literature that shows that high out-of-pocket costs decrease people's use of health care services. It's pretty clear. If people have to pay out of their pockets, they simply skip health care. At a time when we increasingly recognize that adherence to treatment is increasingly important, and we heard it throughout the morning, to achieve other systemic goals such as cost efficiencies and good health outcomes, insurance that creates greater consumer costs at the point of service may work against those very goals. The trend towards shifting even greater proportions of healthcare spending to the consumer at the point of service is growing even though in the large employer market with over 15 million people, are now enrolled in high deductible health plan coverage. So even at the employer level, we're getting a shift again to people uh, in terms of their out-of-pockets. The Affordable Care Act could facilitate this cost shift even greater in the large group market in a number of ways, and I won't go through all of them, but one way, again, is through the diffusion of low premium and high out-of-pocket plan models. And when you see those kinds of models combined, with the reimbursement levels that we're seeing so far with the exchanges, you can see why that would be a real issue for innovation. So if you're running the Yale Medical Center or, or MGH or the Brigham or University of Pennsylvania, and your reimbursement level, let's say for a gallbladder procedure, is set at the level of a community hospital in Oklahoma on the theory that those are similar procedures, how does a medical center meet its tripartite mission of care, research, in education, how do we produce the next generation of physicians and care providers? How do we come up with better ways to deliver care in those particular models? So I want to make it clear, we're here as pharmaceutical executives. This is not just about pharmaceutical innovation. It's about innovation across the board. And so my big concern right now would be to ensure that we don't have a healthcare system that provides broad coverage but focuses only on prices within a silo. I think our goals were what they were articulated at the beginning of health care reform, was we want to improve quality in terms of outcomes and care, and we want to lower systemic costs. And I think so far, what we've set up isn't aimed at doing those two things. So let me stop and turn it over to, to Roy. Thanks, Ken. The, uh, we will get back to questions, specific questions for you on that, and I hope you're all thinking about questions. Uh, next for Alex, uh, the, uh, we've heard the effect of premiums could have, but what impact uh, might these uh, premiums have on innovation and, and uh, what can be done to ensure that innovation is uh, 
not slowed within the industry since we're so dependent on it for continuing improvement in health care as we've seen in the past. Well, thank you, Roy. And uh, Ken, thanks for your comments and getting things started. And John, it's always a pleasure to sit up here with you. And you know, I, got, I must admit, though, Roy, when you were first introduced us and you said, now, there's this attorney, this soldier, and this chemist, I wasn't sure what kind of joke we were going towards <laughs> with that. But uh, that's, that's coming later. You made me feel a lot better. Uh, you know where you actually end up, because we could have gone in a lot of different uh, bad ways. But uh, look, it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon, and particularly around, I think, the, uh, uh, the topic du jour of uh, health care, health care reform, access, affordability, high quality value, all these topics that, um, you know, it's interesting. I think all three of us would say we're pretty fortunate uh, to be working in the kind of organizations where we can do good, do well, and we're able to travel around and, and meet with scientists, decision makers, stakeholders around the world. And, um, you know, whether it's here in New York City, whether I'm in West Virginia, California, or frankly, Mumbai, Shanghai, uh, Warsaw, or Sao uh, Paulo, this whole issue of health care and how are we going to provide high quality, high value health care in a sustainable way is likely the biggest issue we have in our generation. And I dare say, if you peel back the onion skin of the budget issues here that we've been, you know, haggling over, and we're continuing, you know, I still, unfortunately, I think we've got a lot of tough sledding ahead. If we uh, go to Europe and look at some of the uh, difficult austerity issues that they're facing there, and even when we go to the growing markets and talk to leaders there, one of their concerns about the future is how do we do that? And, um, and so I think having this kind of discussion is just more important than ever. And I would say that, um, you know, frequently when we're, when we're looking at health care, we tend to look at it as a cost. And it's irrefutable. We've got to look at it from that perspective. But, you know, part of what I'd say this afternoon is we've got to look at it in a lot different way also as an investment. And as an investment in productivity, as an investment in, frankly, stability in society, as an investment in well-being. And, um, you know, certainly the least expensive patient is the patient that's not with us. And it, so as we think about, you know, the future and healthcare and how we're going to take this on, I think thinking about what role innovation plays and how we look at it as an investment is more important than ever. Now, look, I, we're very fortunate, J&J, &J, to, uh, you know, most people out there know us as a uh, baby shampoo and as a baby powder company. Come on, you can smell it. I see you smiling out there when I say that. But, uh, you know, as one, of, uh, as one of the world's larger pharmaceutical companies and the largest medical device company, we're fortunate because you know, one of the greatest parts of my job is engaging with the science and the technology and the customers and, and the patients and that, you know, touch those many different areas. And picking up on some of what Ken said earlier, we've seen a very interesting phenomenon. And it's one of those issues where you've got to be careful about the unintended consequences. But starting in about 2009 or 2010, for the first time in recent history, you know, and we, we touch a lot of patients when you think about the sutures that we make that are used in almost every surgery or, you know, the, the, the pharmaceutical products that we make. We actually saw a connection between the macroeconomic environment and the downturn and the utilization of healthcare. And if you looked at prior to 2009, you could see healthcare moving along, and depending which market you were in and how you split up volume versus price, you, know, you saw at least mid single digit increases in almost every area. And for the first time in inpatient procedures, outpatient procedures, even primary care physician office visits, we saw a downturn. And, you know, obviously the, that begs the question well, what's causing that? You know, is it high unemployment rates here in this country. And, and by the way, this was not only a phenomenon here in the United States, but you saw another in Europe as well. But is it high unemployment rates? That certainly had to have something to do. Higher co-pays, to your point. Uh, or was it simply, as we called it, the I don't want to be out of my chair syndrome for an extended period of time, maybe taking, having a discretionary procedure that I really don't need because I'm, not, I'm uncertain about my future when I return. It's likely a combination of all those things, but I would, I would estimate that, 
you know, whether or not that's a secular or cyclical issue, I don't think the underlying rate necessarily of disease and, you know, treatment is changing. And the, the question we have to ask ourselves, what will be the consequence of the defer, the delay that that may incur further down the road? Because I think if we look at some of the other facts around things like demographics, you know, and I'm sure that's been covered partially here already, but when you think in this country alone, 12% of us are over the, you know, over the age of 65, that's going to go to 25%. When you think about once you turn 65, you consume three, five, maybe even more times the amount of health care that you do if you're, you know, prior to 65. You start doing the sheer math on that, and the numbers can be daunting. And then when you look at the diseases that we're going likely to get as we get older, rates of Alzheimer's, diabetes, even though we're doing a great job on cardiovascular disease, that's still going to be an issue. Oncology, areas like that. You know, while we've done some tremendous research, and the companies up here on the you know, panel today, I think we'd all admit we've got a lot of work left to do. And so how we deal with this issue of what I believe will be increasing demand over time, but providing that and keeping innovation alive. Because so much of what we're doing, whether it's you know, the biomarkers, where there's so much promise right now in the pharmaceutical world, uh, a lot of work needs to be done in that area, but certainly a lot of promise. Less invasive procedures. How can we get people mobile, out of the hospital faster, recovery sooner? And I, and I also think a big component going forward, we're going to have to spend a lot of time thinking about innovation, is how do we prevent disease from occurring in the first place? And how do we get better at preventing using, you know, a number of the sciences, vaccines, and even think about wellness and how do we create systems that reward and encourage wellness and health and moving from sick care to well care uh, is going to be a critical part of the innovation. So. Roy, getting back to the very first question, I think innovation is going to remain absolutely essential. We've got to make sure that in all of these systems and around the world that we build systems where innovation is rewarded. Because if we don't take on some of these big issues around some of these diseases, around some of the challenges we face, we're not just going to manage our way through it. We're going to need to innovate our way through it to really make a difference. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Uh, and we will get back to you with specific questions again. Um, next, John, uh, left liner. Um, what effect will the ACA uh, have on the biopharmaceutical industry in relation to international competition and uh, contribution to the economy? Uh, are we going to have a problem with that going forward? Thanks, Roy, and it's, uh, it's great to be here with, uh, with Ken and Alex. I appreciate the invitation, the chance to speak this afternoon. Uh, a couple of facts to begin with, and maybe these are, are well known to this audience, maybe not. Battelle just released a, a report of, uh, looking at 2011 figures. Biosciences industry account for more than 800,000 jobs in this country. They have a four to one job multiplier effect. So there are, there are essentially 3.4 million U.S. jobs that are created uh, out of this industry um, with, with salaries that, that are more than double the, uh, the average wage in the U.S. The biopharma industry contributed in 2011 about $800 billion to the economy. Uh, exports totaled uh, between 2005 and 2010 $232 billion. That grew 61 percent over those five years. U.S. inventors uh, and companies hold the intellectual property rights to a majority of new medicines today. And we account in this country for about 80% of all the biotech R&D that's done around the world. U.S. biopharmaceutical uh, companies uh, invested about $50 billion in R&D in that year, 2011. So what contributes to this kind of track record, this kind of success? Well, the frame that I've been using for several years in terms of what really promotes or sustains innovation has three elements. One is substrate. You've got to have the science. You've got to have a, a reason to believe that, that, that you, you have something you can work on to develop a new medical device or a new medicine. And of course, we, we've never had better opportunities today with new science, new targets, new knowledge. Uh, what puts that at risk? Obviously, NIH funding does. Uh, the, the source 
of much of that basic knowledge, that substrate comes through the, the NIH. You need, secondly, a human pool of human resources. You need a, an infrastructure. We're blessed in this country with great academic institutions, uh, with, with well-trained scientists, and, and we're, we're, we're a magnet also for scientists around the world who want to come and work here, although that's threatened by this crazy ongoing debate on, on immigration that we need to get resolved. Again, NIH funding puts some of this at risk. It means fewer training grants. It means that that pool of, of talent uh, potentially would diminish, and our uh, uh, K-12 education system, which has been found wanting in many parts of this country, also threatened to undermine that, that middle, middle section, that, that, that human resource pool that converts that substrate into products. And finally, you need a, a functioning economy, small e, uh, in order to attract risk capital. And, and that's only going to happen when there's a prospect of a reward. And uh, so innovation must be rewarded, or the, 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 all the upfront investment you want to make, or all the substrate you think you have to work with, all the talented people, won't produce useful products. So these are all variables. And although we lead the world today uh, uh, in biomedical innovation, uh, con our continued leadership is not guaranteed by any means. And there are, there are many countries, there are regions, there are regions within countries that that uh, today uh, very much want to compete with us for a share of the pie here. Now, in terms of the impact of the ACA on innovation, uh, on March 23rd, 2010, when the a ACA was uh, signed into law, uh, in essence, the, the pharma industry was, uh, was, was uh, on the line for what we estimate is going to be about $115 billion in payments in over 10 years. Some of those come out of revenue, some come out of expenses. Um, if you do a 20% uh, percent of sales investment in R&D and, and recognize that some of that, that money comes out of different parts of the income statement, that alone would take 20 to $30 billion out of R&D investment uh, over, uh, over this, uh, this period if, if nothing else uh, changed. And obviously, you know, part of that is, is the tax uh, that, that was levied on our companies, uh, paying, paying for the seniors to get through the donut hole, the higher Medicaid rebate. And, and a uh, broader use of 340B, which, which impacts us in a negative way. Uh, we were pretty clear at the outset that we don't like this IPAB feature, this Independent Payment Advisory Board, uh, which, uh, which is really put in place. It, it's a group of people accountable to essentially no one who are charged with, in essence, sort of taking costs out of Medicare, even though uh, hospitals and some other institutions are exempt uh, from, from IPAB until 2019. So obviously this is something that, uh, that, that we in the industry are very concerned about and remain concerned about. Uh, Part, D, <clears throat> Part D rebates are still on the table. If, if all the dual eligibles in Part D or the low income subsidy people were switched over to a Medicaid type rebate system, the impact on the industry would be probably a little bit more than what the impact of the ACA has been, somewhere we estimate 120 to $135 billion. So again, do your multiplier. That's what's going to come out of R&D. Well, and, and then there's the omnipresent threat of repeal of non-interference in Part D, another discussion, not technically part of the ACA, but something that's very important. What are the up, potential upsides for innovation, uh, biologics, exclusivity? Uh, Although there wasn't bipartisan agreement on many elements of the ACA, this particular measure enjoyed broad bipartisan support, 12 and a half years of data exclusivity for biologics, although the President's most recent budgets have suggested that should be taken back to seven years. As Roy said, I thought it was the law, 12 and a half, but um, we'll continue to fight that. By the way, the savings amounts to $3 billion. The, the OMB estimates the savings of repealing uh, uh, data package protection from 12 and a half to seven years is $3 billion over 10 years. It's a drop in the bucket compared to what that same investment can yield in terms of, of new medicines. And finally, the question of access, expanded access, I think it's a double-edged sword. I think for the industry, having more people being confident that they can access medicines when they need them through an insurance program, that's inherently good for our industry. We saw this with Medicare Part D. Uh, you know, the, we, the lo lowest point we stood in terms of industry reputation was prior to the passage of Part D because seniors reckoned they would need what we make and, and, and discover, but they weren't sure they were going to be able to afford them. That changed with Part D, whether they're <coughs> accessing generics or branded medicines. I think it's a good thing for the industry in general. 
that the people in this country where we lead the world in biomedical innovation can be reasonably assured of being able to have access to, to these medicines. Now, in terms of expanded access, you know, the question all of us have been asked since this, the ACA uh, uh, was signed into law was, you know, what's the upside for the industry? And I, I don't think any of us have been able to s respond definitively that it, it's going to be, a, you know, it's going to uh, lift all boats or it's going to be particularly good for company A or company B. And I think, frankly, the verdict is still out on that. I think a lot has to do with uh, which kinds of plans do consumers buy into and, and is a low premium uh, going to result in, in drug coverage that, in essence, does not give the newly insured uh, the same kind of access to the formulary, the, the broad formulary that, mo frankly, most seniors have in most Part D plans today. So I think that's something we need to keep an eye on, and I expect over the next couple of years the answer to that question will be, become more clear. May I make a comment um, yeah. while you're going up there? I, I do think that Coming back to the Part D example, I do think that if you go back and you would see the stories about seniors going to Canada to get drugs because they were so much cheaper, that was the low point for the industry. But you can see a train wreck coming. If people are signing up for coverage on the basis of price of premiums, and then they later on get sick, and they find out they have to pay 40% of their drug costs, we're going to have exactly that same issue all over again because people are going to say, I can't afford to pay for it out of my pocket. We're going to get a sub-optimization of care. It was a Federal Reserve study a couple years ago that talked about the statins. We talked about them this morning. And that for the first 10 years of the statins availability on the market, the benefit to society, just in terms of medical costs versus the cost of treatment, was 7 to 1. And we've seen that with immunizations, low birth rate babies. We've seen it with a number of issues. So now just project going forward. Mm. What are the two biggest issues that are going to bankrupt us? One is mm. diabetes, and the other is Alzheimer's. We talked about both of them this morning. If you live to be age 65, and because of the work of this industry, a lot of people live to be age 65, you have a 1 in 10 chance of having Alzheimer's. If you live to be 85, you have a 1 in 2 chance of having Alzheimer's. So with all the reform that we're doing to the system, if we don't provide room for this kind of scientific innovation, there is no amount of process or coverage innovation that's going to prevent that tidal wave from flowing over us from those two conditions alone, let alone some of the other issues that have dealt with, uh, that are going to be, have to be dealt with going forward. Okay, so I think we've touched on many of the major issues going forward, but I think these, this, this uh, group would like some uh, reactions to, uh, by the three of you to some uh, very important questions for the people in this room. Uh, plans for research and development within the industry. Uh, impact of, of the, the uh, ACA. What do you think, Ken? Well, I think um, if you look at Europe as an exemplar of markets where you do have universal coverage and really focus on low pharmaceutical prices. You see European country, companies locating to the United States because it's an environment that's consistent with having pharmaceutical innovation. The reason why we're the leaders in the world is we have an environment that is conducive to pharmaceutical innovation. I think if we go to a model that's somewhat like that, that is to say broad coverage, which I think we all agree with, everyone in this country should have access to coverage. But if that coverage is such that the prices for innovation are driven down, then I think we're going to have an issue 10 years from now with respect to how much money can be profitably put into R&D. You heard uh, a remark early this morning that a dollar invested in R&D has been returning 83 cents on a dollar. That's not the kind of thing that the capital markets are going to continue to reward. And because of the long investment lead times, they have to look and say, is there going to be a functioning market? for a new <clears throat> Alzheimer's drug or a new cancer drug. So I'm very much worried about that. On the other hand, in all fairness, I think our industry really has to come forward with real innovations, by which I mean to say innovations where there is no question that the value to the healthcare system and to people is sufficiently great that people should pay premium prices for those drugs. I don't think we should necessarily come forward with drugs that are modest innovations. If we can show, for example, that the use of this drug 
reduces system-wide costs, then we should share in those savings. So for me, it's, I think it gives us an incentive, if you think about it, to come up with drugs that have unquestioned, unambiguous value. And I think that's where we actually can continue to move forward as an industry. Yeah, that, that is the incentive. It's also the challenge because, as you know, uh, research people always start with the idea that the drug is going to make a major impact. And yet, after working at it for many years, may come up with something that makes a very minor impact, and they say, well, but we've got to recover our costs. Right. You know, Roy, if I could just pick up on that. Yes. Because I, I, I really do think it's, a, um, it's an issue we face as an industry and, frankly, for all of healthcare. And it mm. starts with, you know, some of the diseases that Ken just mentioned, and I'm sure that were discussed this morning, things like Alzheimer's, things like diabetes, these are really difficult conditions and riddles, frankly, to try to solve. And I'll leave it to John, who obviously is a chemist, can uh, be much more uh, was <laughs> um, eloquent in his description. But you know, the conditions that, we're, that, frankly, are going to impact us the most are some of the more complex. And the day of simply taking a single receptor and being able to plug it in, turn it slightly, and get a good solution, we figured out a lot of those areas, much due to the hard work of many of the people in this room. The things we're taking on now are much more complex, much more challenging, you know, and represent systems, cascades of disease that, um, you know, from the researchers that I've spoken to are likely going to take significantly more research for us to be able to solve and resolve. And related to that is the issue of Absolutely, we want to bring products to market that really make a difference. But when you swing for the fences all the time, it can be a very risky proposition. And by definition, you know, the greater leap we go for in science, the more risk that's inherent in that swing. And, and what we usually tend to see is either, you know, once in a while we see the great breakthroughs, but we tend to see incremental science where we make a marginal improvement, something slightly more. And before you know it, you've gone from A to B, B to C, C to D. You've gone from A to Z, and you see tr significant uh, progress. And by the way, hopefully in some of those cases, we've learned a lot about managing the risks associated with it as well. So I think that's going to be part of the balance that we're going to have to deal with is how do we, how do we strive for significant improvements? And, and by the way, a whole other conversation about the data, the science that's then required to demonstrate that in a statistically significant way uh, is often requested. Balancing that with a lot of patient need in between and frankly important learnings mm -hmm. that we need to think about as we create the science yeah. to you know, ultimately produce these products and treatments. Yes, thanks John. Uh, John? Well, yeah. I'd just make a brief comment, go back to, to what we learned, building on something Ken was talking about earlier, what we learned from Part D. Um, in February of this year, the, the, uh, the CBO came out and uh, lowered the projected cost of Medicare spending over the next 10 years by $137 billion. Now, 75% of that lower spending rate, <clears throat> it was due to, to medicines, in essence, uh, either lower acquisition costs, four out of five prescriptions today in this country are for generic medicines, which, by the way, are our legacy. We may not be in that business, but there are the only reason we have Four dollars a month at Walmart is because somebody did the, the uh, the made the investment, took the risk beforehand. But it also to see this is important. The CBO acknowledged for the first time that the use of medicines, the broader use of the appropriate medicines in Part D, was lowering system costs. So this this I think was a, a breakthrough, and I, I I hope that you know. Uh, the government, having discovered the, the, having stumbled upon the truth, doesn't go on as if nothing had happened, as Churchill once said. Okay, we should learn from this. Broad formularies and broad access to medicines are an in, is an integral part of providing good and effective health care. JAMA did a study. I don't know, Ken. This was a couple years ago, I think, where they looked at here's the pool of people pre Part D. Here's the same group of people post Part D. $1,200 <clears throat> per year per person enrolled on Part D and lower medical costs, the only difference being they had access through Part D to, to medicines. And most seniors do have access to a broad formulary. So we've got to learn from that. And I think as we, we think about what we really want out of the Affordable Care Act, which is <clears throat> better health for this right. population, yeah. the data is right in front of us. Yeah, they are. So I think we're all convinced that research and development is critical for the future. Uh, 
One thing that was brought up briefly was the potential of oversight of pricing. And that is, uh, there, and there, there has been a lot of press that some of, some of the products in the recent years have, have been at very high price, uh, modest contributions, and, and, and prices have been rising, price increases have been faster than the inflation rate by a couple of fold. Uh, would you make comments on, on the potential for price controls in, in light of the overview that people are discussing? Do we anticipate any price controls going forward? Well, I sincerely hope we don't have price controls in this country. Again, I, we, we have done the experiment elsewhere. You can look at what happens in Europe. You can look at the amount of money that gets allocated to innovation in Europe. I think the political challenge we have is that when I go down to the Hill, people say, well, why shouldn't we be like Germany? Why should, if the Germans actually put price controls on drugs, why shouldn't we? And the answer is, a lot of what John said, there's a real benefit to the society that goes well beyond the price of drugs of having an innovative pharmaceutical industry. And by the way, it's not just the industry. We talked about this morning the whole ecosystem that exists with NIH, with academia, and how all of these things working together keep the U.S. at the lead. I just came back from China. If you're in China, it's really clear they are going through their 12th five-year plan and at the top of their five-year plan is they want to climb the curve of innovation in biopharmaceuticals. They understand <clears> that that's <throat> where we want to be in the world. And I don't think it makes sense for us as a country to follow the path of Europe. I don't think it makes sense for us as a country to want to compete in areas where we know eventually the world is not moving. We already are a leader in areas like biopharmaceutical research. And I think if we create an environment in this country that doesn't provide you know, an incentive for the capital markets to keep investing, i.e. price controls or IPAB, I'm afraid that we will not have the kind of innovation that's going to be necessary to avoid what the Alzheimer's Society says will be the bill for Alzheimer's in 2050, which is $1 trillion. So a disease-modifying agent for Alzheimer's, it's impossible to conceive that we could charge too much, given that the cost of the disease will be $1 trillion in just a few years. Yeah. Anybody want to add? Uh, Alex? Uh, um, Ken, all good points, uh, which I would agree with. I think the other, you know, to, um, to add on to what he was saying, I think that w the other issue we have to think about is what exactly are we going to talk about when we talk about price and cost? Particularly if we move to an environment that is going to have more of an outcomes focus. And you know, our, our current system is quite complicated. It does tend to take a line item approach frequently by law or by si the systems that we've built. And I think staying focused more on what impact we're actually seeking, uh, what the in overall intended outcome is, is going to be much more important. And, and here, again, is I think one aspect of our current healthcare system that can, you can have a lot of unintended consequences by focusing specifically on an individual price versus the entire system. So I think that's a, uh, a warning and an opportunity for us. Yeah, yeah. John? Just a couple of comments. I think uh, for the 2012, if I recall correctly, the, the, the total, total of what we paid for for medicines in this country actually fell slightly versus the previous year for the first time in maybe in history. Now part of that is a function obviously of a lot of our medicines becoming available in generic in generic form. But but certainly uh, uh, I, I think that's you know an indication of not only the fact that that medicines in general are accessible and affordable, but the fact that you know the drugs bill is not at least in that year outpacing the, the growth of health care in general. In addition, and, and I think many people here know this, in addition to 80 percent, 80 plus percent of medicines being available in generic form or prescriptions being written uh, for generics in this country, we have lower cost generics than most other countries around the world where what we might call a generic is a branded generic and typically is a, a decent fraction of the, of the innovator price. Now with respect to cost, you know, that I get asked this question all the time, how do you justify a, cancer therapy that's $25,000 a year or whatever, I think you can go out there and pick things out and drill down to the point where, you know, you, you, well, for this patient, was that cost worth it and all these sorts of things. I think you've got to look at the aggregate. And in aggregate, our companies compete 
on price in almost every category we work in today. So there's a list price, but to get on that formulary, uh, to get on that, that, that PBM formulary, to get into Part D, we have to compete. We have to offer uh, value, sometimes compared to our own generic versions of our own product. So there, there is a market uh, somewhere here, and, and I think, you know, <clears throat> we, we, can't, we can't kill the market in, in our efforts to try to make sure that, that, that people can access and, and afford medicines. Right. Well, I think the, these are critical points, and perhaps the uh, one that stands out for me is the fact that an important new drug in Alzheimer's, or a really important drug in cancer, uh, which may be closer, who knows, uh, will change public opinion to a great degree. People really hang on what's happened recently, and, and uh, it, it's crit critical for the industry that we continue to innovate. So let me ask for questions from the audience. Uh, anyone want to ask? We have experts here. Yes, please. Can we have a mic here? Uh, this is Dave Holtzman from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I think everything that the three panelists stated about the need for innovation in R&D is, I mean, everybody in this room would probably completely agree with this and for all the reasons you stated. <clears throat> the Affordable Health Care Act, if you, while there, there's issues you also raised about why it may or may not be the right way to go, if you throw that out for a minute and you say before President Obama and the law went into effect, if you had to create a law that was different than that, what would you do? Because in our hospital alone, 35,000 people come to the emergency room with no um, insurance every year, and the costs, then they're not going to the doctor, they're not, what would you do to fix that problem? Okay given some of the interest in the, in, in the industry that we need to go forward. So you want me to take a shot at it? Uh, so let me start by repeating something that I said at the beginning. I think that as a country, we need to have a situation where all Americans have access to affordable insurance coverage. I think that alone made the, the law worth doing. But when we approached healthcare, we had multiple goals in mind, one of which was this universal coverage of everyone. But the other ones had to do with the right balance between quality and cost. And I think what we lost was the provisions of the law that would really provide both accountability and support to delivering healthcare in a way that both improves care and reduces costs. And I think that if you look at some of the private insurance companies, we're working with people to do that. So for example, it, it should be known that with a lot of our insurance clients now, we are working together to improve adherence. Because we know that you know, it's, a, it's a very small percentage of patients that actually drive 50% of the health care in this, in this country. So if you look at diabetics, if you can get certain diabetic patients to take their medicine regularly, mm -hmm. some estimates you can eliminate 50% of the health care cost. <coughs> And they wouldn't go to the, to the emergency room. So the question becomes, how do we ensure that type 2 diabetics are taking their medicine on a regular basis? Because we know if they don't, the sequelae are much more expensive than the cost of, of the intervention. So my point to you again is coverage, we absolutely needed to do that. In fact, my view is it was a disgrace that it took until 2010 for us to cover every American. So I applaud that. I have to say, though, that we stopped short of the other two issues, which are the accountability and support for delivery of better care at lower cost. Thanks, Ken. Uh, John? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a system expert. I mean, I, I think the, the industry in 2009, 2010 threw its support behind the, the ACA, and uh, yet we acknowledge then and we acknowledge now it's not perfect. Um, when I get asked about the ACA when I travel abroad, I think there's a perception overseas that this is sort of the beginning and the end. Uh, this is health care reform writ large. And my, my view is that this is not the beginning of the end. And again, as someone once said, I don't think it's the end of the beginning. I think health care reform will continue to play out. I know of only one case where I've seen in any size population an example of where uh, quality uh, has improved, uh, access has, has, has been, you know, strong, 
and where, where costs have come down, and that's Safeway Supermarkets. I mean, if you listen to the CEO that, who just retired from Safeway, I think one of the most interesting experiments mm -hmm. done in healthcare delivery in the last 10 years <clears throat> was done in that context. And <clears throat> as a private employer, someone who has 60,000 lives <clears throat> in the U.S. that we cover through uh, employer insurance, you can bet we're looking hard at, at lots of things we're doing within our little ecosystem to try to, to, to uh, reduce cost and, and improve quality. And I hope that kind of experimentation can continue alongside the, the more system-wide approaches that, that we know we need to take. Look, I, w I would agree no, that um, I think phase one on the Affordable Care Act basically was providing access. And I think we all would, you know, agree that the ultimate goal is then how do we ensure we have high quality, sustainable health care that we can provide to help people live longer, healthier, and happier lives. But there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on this second part. And so I think making sure that we don't lose the focus on quality, on coordination of care, major issue. Um, and something that both John and Ken mentioned earlier that I think is also representative of uh, Medicare Part D is the ability of government and business and a number of other stakeholders to work together collaboratively and actually produce an outcome where if I understand right, I think the patient satisfaction scores are actually quite high and costs actually have come in far under projection. Now there's not many times we've ever heard that actually occurring in a program that large. So I think there is a model there that works and uh, certainly something that I think that we should keep in mind as we go forward. Can I just make one more sure, comment? Sure. Because I don't want to be theoretical in my answer. So let me drill down and talk about how we try to provide health care to some 80,000 Merck employees. There are two divergent things going on with our employee population. There is a shift to the consumer's pocketbook at point of sale, point of care, to ensure that people are not overusing health care. But at the same time, we are shifting to get much more focus on prevention and treatment adherence. If you are a diabetic, we want you to take those pills. We're not trying to save money on the medicines. The same time, so those two things that at, at first glance would strike you as sort of diametrically opposed, but they're actually aimed at what I was saying. They're really aimed at ensuring that people don't overutilize certain health care, but at the same time, they don't underutilize certain health care. And I think that there's no perfect system, but at least what we're trying to do as an employer is to ensure that we actually drive down costs where it's appropriate, but also improve the overall health of our employee population, which in the long run is what's going to drive the cost up. Yes. Thank you. Um, Marion Wentworth with Merck. Um, first, a comment on your observation, Dr. Vagelos. Um, the, uh, you know, if an Alzheimer's drug becomes available, consumers will be thrilled. It will be an amazing boon for... Mm, I um, will predict that one will become available. Where I'm going to disagree with you, Dr. Vagelos, mm. is that that won't automatically transform the reputation of the industry. And in particular, because of the animosities that we discussed earlier today, uh, in the academic community, in the medical professional society community, et cetera, um, there are a lot of consumer-facing individuals who will be very anti-industry at the same time that they're very pro the results of an innovation. And that kind of cognitive dissonance is something that the consumer population in this country can hold very closely, and we've seen it in a lot of other areas as well. Which brings me to my question. Um, one of the things we've said that we really need is meaningful innovation, that that's really part of what we have to deliver. And what I'm wondering is who gets to arbitrate what meaningful innovation really is, and is that changing? Ken? Well, I would hope that it would be arbitrated in the best way in which our democracy arbitrates every decision. We, our democracy is based on the theory that decisions made by lots of people like physicians and patients, are inherently superior to decisions made by a small group of people in a room. We've seen that over and over again. It's the underlying theory of democracy. And so I would think over time, when we look at these kinds of breakthroughs, <clears throat> Elliot was talking this morning about your boy and what an important breakthrough that is. We should allow people in the marketplace to look at the results, the data, 
we should have to demonstrate the value. It shouldn't be theoretical. But once we demonstrate the value, we should leave it up to physicians and patients and payers to do that in concert with each other. That's where the competition comes in. Insurers, you would say, they, they wouldn't want to pay for that. But actually, they have to compete to get people to join their plans. So there's, the marketplace has the balance that's inherent in the democratic model. Look, and I think an important component of that is transparency, of making sure whether it's transparency regarding our data, transparency regarding education, options that are available. Uh, a number of different issues are going to be very important to be able to make the best informed decisions by multiple stakeholders in these cases. Because I, I would agree, I think the more transparent, the more solid data and information that we can have, you know, ultimately will make the best decisions. I just went through a little medical adventure earlier this year that my aortas that came out of my heart replaced, and I probably had 40 or 50 medicines when I was in the hospital there for seven days. And I can tell you, I don't want some nameless third party deciding in that situation what is meaningful innovation for me. I want it to be a decision that my doctor can make and that I can make if I have a stake in the game, and some of us, depending on what health plans we have, have more of a stake in the game than, than others. I also think that we need to appreciate the fact that incremental innovation adds up. And I, I think Alex made the point earlier, we all want to swing for the fences and hit it out of the park. But for the most part, the medicines we put on the market rep represent incremental mm -hmm. advances. I make no apology about that. Cancer in 1975, when I graduated from university, five-year survival for all cancers combined was 50%. It was a coin toss. Today, it's 70%. Light, better odds. How do we get there stepwise over time for any tumor? You can just catalog progress as you look at surgical techniques, as you look at diagnostics, as you look at drugs. This is the way progress will continue to get made. If we're going to decide that we're the smart people going to clip those incremental steps out, we're not going to continue to make that kind of progress. I think that's true of <clears throat> the history of all drugs, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and I agree with that, of course. We started with the uh, antihypertensives that were rather toxic, mm -hmm. and then safer antihypertensives, and then different kinds of antihypertensives for different kinds of patients, and, and the uh, same thing has happened with, with the uh, cholesterol-lowering drugs, in which there are several different mechanisms now. Things that evolve, they get better, they improve, and, and uh, that's how we benefit. Uh, okay, other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, for this amazing forum today. Uh, this morning, the personalized medicine session talked a lot about the tension between how there is great power in genomics to provide research and to provide, mm. provide data. At the same time, there's a huge amount of anxiety on the part of consumers about where will that data go and how do, I think that tension um, and sort of the highlight for the panel is that context matters a whole lot. That happens to be the name of um, the company I work for. Context really does matter. And we very much are providing perspective on some of the really big decisions that um, pharma companies and friends of pharma face. To that end, like, I'm really interested in you guys. You've got amazing perspective on the next 10 years of life sciences. What are some of the biggest things you could tell people to watch out for and to think about to set the context for the future? Because I think the best part of today has been that there's reason for a lot of optimism about the research and things to come. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ken. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. and. Uh, you know, I wasn't here for the panel this morning, but it sounds like it was a great dialogue. Look, I, as I look at it, I think there's a number of areas. One, if I start with our pharma area, it is the potential to be much more targeted about where and where we do not use certain thera therapeutics. And, uh, you know, as we reflect on it now, uh, John was talking earlier about the great progress we've made in oncology. And 
as I talk to our researchers in, in that area, uh, it truly is just beginning to see the response and to see the potential uh, where, you know, we better understand so many different conditions now as very heterogeneous conditions and what muta specific mutation is leading to a particular type of disease. So for me, that holds huge potential. And, and by the way, if we can also target people who may have a reaction to a compound where we've taken drugs off the market because a very rare subset has a particular negative, uh, you know, or side effect, and suddenly make that treatment option available for people, and we've got numerous examples of that in our history, that's another great uh, option. You know, when I think about uh, devices, I actually think the potential for combinations of devices and biologics and pharmaceuticals has got a ton of potential going forward. And if we can get more targeted delivery to certain areas, if we can come up with new, unique applications of delivering, you know, a therapeutic vis-a-vis -a, -vis a device to a specific site, uh, again, great potential, and we're working hard in a lot of different areas there. And again, all with the potential uh, impact of increasing effectiveness, and decreasing morbidity and mortality, you know, associated with it. I'd say third for me is the area of Regen Med. And, uh, you know, when you think about it now, we go basically from, uh, and you know I'd have to say this, Tylenol to knee replacement. Now there's a couple of things in between that we can do, but it's pretty difficult. And, you know, the, and many people look at, you know, as you go around this room, have a prosthetic device, are thinking about having to get one. And, you know, how can we intervene sooner to regenerate our own cartilage, our own uh, skeletal system, the own musculature? Uh, and again, there's a lot of very interesting science. Uh, it's still very early. Uh, I think that may be later down the road. But for me, that's an area where we can help the body regenerate itself in other interesting ways. And by the way, that applies to cardiac tissue, the eye, so many different areas that we're involved in now that I think could be really exciting. So those are three examples that I would put out there. Uh, one last question, and, and then we have to close this section. Peter Young from Young Partners. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about ecosystem for the pharmaceutical industry, and I'd be very interested for opinion from any one of you about the balance that you see between internal research, uh, licensing and partnering with biotech companies, and then the topic earlier, which was uh, academic institutions, because obviously all of you have to have some blend. So how do you strike that balance? I'll ask John to take that, and we'll have only one answer so that we can close that. Well, good, I get to answer for everybody. <laughs> I, I, think we're, I think we're on the cusp of, of a new set of relationships within this ecosystem. Uh, I, I, think, I think we're moving from a kind of a quid pro quo, here's what I do, here's what you do, here's what I can do for you, to something that's much more integrated. I, I think medicines in the future are going to come from, are going to have multiple authors, <laughs> okay? And you know, there's going to be a lead author. But I, I think the way we work with academic institutions, with biotech companies, with not-for-profits, and with, uh, with even with the, the NIH, uh, I, I think is beginning to look much more promising to me in terms of <clears throat> relationships that really do take advantage of what we each can bring to the table, tear down some of the walls and barriers that, that have characterized some of these relationships in the past. I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic. I think it's, it's part of the path forward for the industry, and, it, and it's happening. Thank you, John. Well, I think what we've heard today is that the ACA is here. Uh, everybody's pleased that there's going to be coverage, broader coverage of the population. There are some questions, and I would just remind you that the uh, reform plan that took place in Massachusetts has gone through several amendments since it was passed, and therefore there will be amendments to the Obamacare to bring it, I hope, in line with some of the aspirations that we've heard today, because we're, we're really dependent on uh, academia and industry to do the job to continue our health care improvement. So thank you all for being here, and thank you, Ken, thank Alex, you. and John.